about a year ago, I visited the Shelburne for the first time and, and had the privilege of meeting the gentleman you're going to see speak tonight. Not only did, did Corey's assistance help bring our exhibition to a level that we could not have imagined, in a sense, it was a, a kind of magnetic force that allowed the exhibition to grow and become as massive as it, as it truly did. So can't say enough about this gentleman, uh, Corey Rogers, who is chief curator at the Shelburne Museum, Shelburne, Vermont. If you haven't been there, it is the country's most diverse museum of paintings, folk arts, quilts, textiles, New England history, and more. Corey has a BA from the University of Oklahoma from the year 2000, an MA from the Smithsonian Associates Parsons School of Design, their master's program in history and American decorative arts. Uh, he also studied history of industrial design, if you're getting a sense of, of the multitude and multifaceted nature of this man, uh, we're just getting going. He started at the Shelburne in 2004 as an intern. And if you listen to him, he'll say he just stuck around long enough to achieve the position he has, but that's not true. He had, uh, advanced to his current position as chief curator in 2018, uh, a massive uh, career that he's already assembled. Um, exhibitions he has curated, such as Full Throttle, Vintage Motorcycles, Custom Choppers, and Racing Machines, Chandelirious, the dazzling world of contemporary chandeliers, natural beauties, ju jewelry from Art Nouveau to now, and an upcoming, uh, this fall, mark your calendars, an upcoming exhibition on the subject you will see tonight, Joel Barber and the Modern Decoy. Without further ado, please let me introduce uh, a special person and my new friend, Corey Rogers. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, John, Zach. Thank you, everyone at the museum here. This has been a really extraordinary experience for me. Um, I think I'm finally developing self-esteem um, because everyone has been so complimentary and kind to me. And so I just want to thank everyone for all of your, your kindness and um, your generous, generous words. Uh, what I wanted to do first is say that when I walked into the gallery yesterday, it was like a kid in a candy shop. I saw extraordinary decoys that I've only seen in books. And it was really a powerful thing for me to be able to see these objects in person. And so I hope that the people of Peoria take the opportunity to come see these decoys in person and really connect with them on that level that I, had, I did yesterday. Before I delve into the subject of my um, lecture, which is really Joel Barber, who was the father of American decoy collecting, um, I want to give you a little bit of context, an overview of what Shelburne Museum is. It's hard to explain Shelburne Museum to people who haven't been there before. Uh, it is, we like to say, delightfully quirky. Um, we have everything, as you'll see, um, under the sun in our collection, which is really extraordinary. And the pattern that you see on the screen here kind of gives you a sense of what you would see at Shelburne Museum. Um, we call this the Electra pattern after Mrs. Webb, the founder of the institution. Shelburne Museum is an open-air uh, facility. It has 39 buildings, um, 25 of which were historic structures that Mrs. Webb had. Um, she, she took them apart, reassembled them on the museum's campus, and she used them as galleries. So they're not technically, we have a couple of historic uh, homes, but mostly they were used as exhibition space. And um, the others were built later on. And we have somewhere between what we think is 100,000 and 150,000 objects. And unlike most museums where the majority of the collection is off view in storage, we estimate that about 80% of our collection is actually on view. I guess I should hold on to this. This is the woman who founded the museum. This is Electra Havemeyer Webb. Um, she was born to H.O. Havemeyer and Louisiana Elder Havemeyer. These were the, um, they had a sugar monopoly in the United States in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Out of the 32 sugar refineries in the country, he owned 29 of them. So he was often derided publicly as the, the sugar pope um, uh, in a lot of the, um, in a lot of newspaper articles. Mrs. Webb had this great spirit about her. She was this very interesting lady. Not only was she a New York socialite, 
but she was also an amazing collector of American folk art. Her parents collected uh, old master European paintings, Asian art and artifacts, as well as they were one of the earliest collectors of French Impressionism. And as you'll see in a second, uh, we have the first Monet to ever come to the American shores in our collection. Um, but Mrs. Webb's collecting interests diverged dramatically from her parents. And there's this great story of Mrs. Webb seeing a tobacconist figure at a, a gas station in Connecticut, and she offered the man $18 for it. And he sold it to her. She had him put it in her car, and she went home, and her mother was there. And the mother says, what have you done? And she said, mother, I'm collecting art. And so it was really interesting to see how their collecting patterns shifted. Mrs. Webb was also a big game hunter. And at one point, she killed the largest Kodiak bear in Alaska at the time. She had it taxidermy. She was ready to ship it back to the United the lower um, 48. Um, but the government stepped in and said, no, you can't export this bear. And they kept it in the airport in Juneau, Alaska. But here she is in her pearls standing next to this great uh, Kodiak, or bear with the um, smile that they used to give them. Mrs. Webb um, wanted to build a museum that looked like Vermont, that looked like New England. And so what she would do is she would find these buildings and she would just move them. This is our blacksmith shop. It's a functioning blacksmith shop at the museum today. And as you can see, she just put it on the back of a truck and she drove it onto the property. She also moved a 210 foot long steamboat two miles across land. Um, she saw what she wanted and she took it. And this is, I love this picture because of the cow's face right here. He's like, what is this? Um, it was a really interesting thing, it happened in 1952. Uh, with, she, did, she had to put it in dry dock, load it onto a railroad that she had constructed from Lake Champlain over to the museum grounds, again, about two miles away. And it took a winch truck three months to move it two miles. And in the middle of it, there was a thaw, and a January thaw, and they were afraid that the earth had underneath it had, um, had uh, thawed out enough that it was going to capsize. Luckily, it didn't. And there's Mrs. Webb standing in front of the, the great steamboat. Several decades later, Shelburne Museum, in the true spirit of Mrs. Webb, decided that we needed a round barn. Round Barn, as many of you may know, is a shaker invention. It's a really smart design where you bring the hay into the top level, the mid oh, sorry, that was the wrong button, uh, into the top level, and then the cows enter in the middle level, the hay comes down the silo, you feed the cows there, and then you collect the manure in the lower level. This building was built in 1901 in Presumption, Vermont, which is in the Northeast Kingdom. It's about, I don't know, 50 miles away from the museum. And so when they took it apart, they discovered they couldn't take the silo apart. And so what did they do? They got a Sikorsky Air uh, helicopter to bring it across the state. And halfway through, one of the cables snapped, and you can see that it's coming in on kind of an angle there. It was a real, a real white knuckle moment for the museum. As I mentioned, we have um, the first Monet to ever come to the American shores. Mrs. Webb's mother, Louisine, was good friends with Mary Cassett. That's how the family wants you to pronounce the name. It's not Cassatt. They don't want you to Frenchify it in their words. Um, and Mrs. Cassatt helped our um, Electra's mother uh, amass this amazing collection of European art, excuse me, Impressionist art. And if you ever go to the Metropolitan Museum in New York and you look at the tagline and look at the donor information, it'll probably say have an art. We have about eight of these um, paintings from Monet, Manet, uh, Degas, um, and uh, a couple Corot in the collection. We also have American paintings. This is one of our favorite pieces by the amazing American artist Andrew Wyeth. And the great story behind this, with these great turkey buzzards kind of circling this house kind of ominously, is that when he, it's a huge painting, not quite this huge, but it's pretty large. And um, the story goes that Andrew Wyeth invited his father, N.C., the great illustrator, to come and take a look at it in progress. And N.C. was very unimpressed with it and let it know. Well, Andrew was deflated, completely deflated, so he turned it over and just left it in the basement and allowed his children to put their train set on the back of it and use it as a platform for their trains. And today it's considered one of the masterpieces of American art, so that's really extraordinary. Um, folk art is a major component of the Shelburne Museum. Mrs. Webb really uh, was attracted to um, folk sculptures, so three-dimensional pieces. We have an amazing folk um, painting collection, but she really, her heart was in the 3D works. 
This is an extraordinary um, weather vane of a mermaid. She's got her mirror in her hand, and that's a comb. And um, she was found in Massachusetts, uh, one of our favorite pieces. And then we have quilts. Shore Museum is really known for our quilt collection. We have about 800 of the country's best quilts. This one in particular, which I'm pretty sure is vibrating on the screen right now, uh, is really extraordinary. And I included it because I love it, because that pattern was inspired by the kaleidoscope. The invention of the kaleidoscope in 1814 changed the way that people saw the world and it influenced the decorative arts that people had in their homes. And so about 70 years later, you're still seeing that kind of vibrant pattern and, and quilts. That brings me to our decoy collection. Um, Shelburne Museum has a really extraordinary collection of about 1,200 decoys. And when I started at the museum, the Dorset House Gallery, this great building, um, I guess it's, it's further on, um, that Mrs. Webb bought to house the collection um, was in desperate need of updating. The climate wasn't right for the decoys. It was really sad. It had incandescent lights that flickered. It was really kind of a depressing space for what we consider to be one of our crown jewels, right? Uh, in terms of collections. And so we wrote a grant um, proposal for the NEH and then gave us money to redo the building and um, reinterpret the collection. And so I spent four years of my life working on nothing but decoys. And I had no idea, had no interest in decoys up until that point. And it was an absolute love affair. I mean, the more I delved into the subject matter, the more my appreciation for, for the decoys um, grew. This is, uh, if you go into the gallery, you'll see this. This is Elmer Kroll's preening black duck. I know a lot of people have problems with the orange bill. Don't, you can tell that to Elmer. Um, but it is really, it's truly extraordinary, and I, I love the details that you see in those primary wings. Another one of my favorites is Chris, Captain Chris Briggs' Hissing Black Duck Hen. I love the, the paint on the back of it, but that mouth is just amazing. We had some uh, fo close photography taken um, when we were doing the book, and you can see the little burrs of the wood in there that he wasn't quite able to, to rasp out. Um, these, are, these are decorative decoys, obviously, but we have working decoys. These are among some of my favorites. These were carved by a man named Louis Rathmel. He was a Stratford carver. He was kind of the fourth generation down. You had Albert Lang, who really established this carving tradition, and Ben Holmes with his acolyte. And then after that, you have um, Charles Shang Wheeler, and then Louis Rathmel. And I think Louis kind of gets, uh, he, he's kind of in the shadows a little too much because his work is really extraordinary. These two decoys were carved for his 1941 rig that he had, and there were 49 decoys uh, in this rig, and supposedly every decoy had a different head position. And the story goes that there was one where the duck looked like it was startled, where it was just like its neck was leaning forward, and Shane Wheeler criticized him for this and said, why would you do that? And Lewis told, supposedly told... Um, Mr. Wheeler, that when have you ever seen a group of ducks together and there wasn't one that was always spooked? And then um, Mr. Wheeler sort of relented. Um, their bodies are made out of cork. Cork is this, this is a composite cork, but the cork is a really important and um, uh, interesting material for carving decoys. It's easy to carve, it's weather, it's rot resistant, um, really extraordinary um, material for decoys. We have some Illinois River decoys. Um, Mr. Ellison here in the front, this beautiful mallard hen. Um, Mr. Ellison carved the decoy. His wife, uh, Catherine, painted them. Really extraordinary um, piece in our collection. We have probably about 30 decoys in total, but really this one and the Shane Hyder goose that you, you'll see here in a second are really the ones that, um, that we, we take a lot of pride in. Um, you'll see examples in the gallery. Zach did an amazing job at bringing in these extraordinary um, Shane Hyder decoys. And I have to make a confession to you. This is how what a green horn I was when I started this. I thought his name was Shone Hyder. And Zach and Bill corrected me, and so now I'm, I'm, I'm initiated. But um, it's a really extraordinary decoy, um, and one of my favorites uh, in, the, in the show. And these were used for hunting later in the fall season on ice. and. Um, I've heard several different versions of why they were on these single um, iron, cast iron feet. 
And one just says that, um, you know, what they would do is they set them out on the ice, the sun would heat up the iron, and that would somehow melt into the surface of the, uh, of the ice and stabilize the decoy. And then I found an article where um, uh, Charles Schneider Jr. was being interviewed, and he said that they were strapped to boards and, and groups and slid out onto the ice, and he said that the apertures that you see here in the, in the webbing of the feet, that's where you would loop them and lash them to the, to the board. So... I, if anyone knows definitively what and how they were used, please, I'm very open to, you, to hearing from you. These are three of the most extraordinary decoys in our collection. Um, they're a, a, a gaggle of Canada geese, and they are um, really extraordinary. They're, as the story goes, they were made in 1848 by a man named Captain um, Charles Osgood. He supposedly was out west in the Bay of um, San Francisco waiting for cargo to be loaded onto his ship. So for some reason it took a long time, about a month, and so he set out on this task of carving these decoys. There are seven of them in existence that we know of. We have five of them, and we have the most animated. So you have the sentinel bird over here, this one is preening, and this one is feeding. And I don't know if you can see it, I'm, I'm sure you can, these things are like nine stories tall, um, but these little pins in their necks that makes them look like grenades. Um, that's actually how the heads are appended to the bodies. And we'll see that in just a second. Here, um, you'll see this, this other pair. This rounds out our five decoys. And what was really great about this project was is that we had two conservators who were working on these decoys. And when they were cleaning the surfaces, we discovered how beautiful the spotted um, decoration was in their plumage. This is just real uh, examples of American, uh, great examples of American folk art. That's how they were put together. And what was most extraordinary for me, does anyone know what those are? They're door hinges, they're brass door hinges. So he would put the corresponding parts together and then he'd slide in that pen and that's what kept them together, which is really extraordinary. Uh, Brants are some of my favorite decoys. I think of Shelburne Museum's collection, they represent the least in terms of their, their volume of number of decoys that we have that are Brants. But when you, if you come to Shelburne Museum and you see our display, you'll see that they're the most animated group of decoys we have in our display. We have them doing everything. We have them tipped up, like they're feeding. We have them sleeping. We have them swimming. Um, really extraordinary. These two birds were carved by um, two members of the same family, um, the Cobb family from Cobb uh, Island in Virginia, uh, North Carolina, excuse me. And what's really extraordinary about these is that you can see they all have similar tails, this undercut V under them. This guy was carved by Nathan Cobb Jr. and his head is most likely a root head. So what you would do is you would find a root that sort of looked like a, a, a bird head and so nature did most of it. You just kind of refined it, which is really extraordinary. And then this was his uncle. Oh, sorry. I keep pushing the wrong button. Um, this was his uncle, Elijah Cobb, who uh, created this bird, which is really, really lovely. And you'll see it again, this, 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 uh, this bird again, when we get to the Joel Barber section of the talk. Um, we have an amazing collection of, um, of uh, shorebird decoys that were primarily given by a man named Richard Mahler had an extraordinary collection, and among them are these beautiful dowager decoys. And their construction is really interesting to me in the fact that their heads are attached to their bodies by a dovetail. You just slide them in. And um, we think that was because it saved the bills when you were transporting them um, to back and forth at, for, while you were hunting. And what's really great is that, oh, sorry, what did I do? Did I kill this? Sorry, David. What's really amazing about those decoys is that when you take their heads off, they have corresponding numbers to them. And we have a wide range of numbers, and the highest number is actually nine. And so it leads us to believe that there were at least nine of these decoys um, that were made to be used as a rig together. Um, some of them show up uh, very often in, um, in uh, auctions, and I'm always curious to see what numbers they are. They may be related to um, some geese that are also um, attach, their heads are attached by dovetails and they have corresponding numbers, but I think definitely the person who made these decoys was somehow related to the furniture manufacturing or was a furniture maker or a carpenter of some sort. And then we have this great Dodge um, manufactory um, Eskimo Curlew, and I included this one because this decoy for me is very poignant in the fact that it represents 
a species that we think may have been hunted into extinction. There are some people who say, no, you spot them every once in a while in the South, uh, South America, but for the most part, we think that they were um, hunted to extinction. They were called doe birds because they would feed themselves, gorge themselves, and when they were shot in the air and they hit the ground, they just kind of burst with seeds or berries. Um, they were um, not great flyers, and uh, so what happens is, is that the United States government steps in, they work with Canada, and they come up with this Migratory Bird Act in 1917, and it, and it passed, I think, in 1918, and effectively what it does is it kills um, hunting of shorebirds, because market gunners are, were brilliant in not only in their skills and their ability to capture the likenesses of these birds, but in the manner in which they killed them. They were very proficient, too proficient, and they depleted the numbers drastically. And so thanks to that um, legislation and some subsequent legislation, um, shorebird populations have rebounded, um, sadly, maybe not for the Eskimo curlew. So I just wanted to mention this is the building that they're housed in, not currently. Um, this was, uh, it's called Dorset Castle in um, Dorset, Vermont, about uh, 80 miles away from the museum. And it was a duplex on either side was a separate house, identical floor plans. So it's an early uh, example of duplexes. Here you can see the carpenters that Mrs. Webb employed taking the building apart and then bringing it to the museum and this is the way it was when, uh, right before they opened it for the decoys. This was the interior, which is really fascinating to me. Today, as a museum curator, seeing these valuable birds out in the open where anyone can have access to them really freaks me out. Um, but that's the way it was done in, in those days. And I didn't put it in the show, but there's a great photograph of a table in the middle of the gallery, and there were probably 15 shotguns just laying out in the open on this on this table, something we definitely wouldn't do today. Um, this is extraordinary. This is one of the punt guns um, that we have in the collection. And you can see uh, visitors at that time were allowed to interact with the pieces. Um, we wouldn't encourage that today. Um, these were extraordinary guns. They could hold up to about two pounds of shot. And the recoil from them was extreme. Some people put uh, bags of oats behind them to help with the compression, and then um, they would move the boat a little bit. Um, these became illegal. It didn't stop some of the market hunters from um, using them after the legislations were passed. Um, and there were, uh, there were some interesting stories uh, in the Harvard Grass area of people in Curative Sound, uh, people who, game wardens who were killed because they you know, came upon someone who was using one of these um, illegal firearms. That's what the building looks like today. Like I said, we renovated it in 2017, and this is what the interior of the gallery looks like now. So I think it's a little bit of an improvement in terms of safety, at least. This brings me to something that is very near and dear to my heart. As I started looking at this collection, I realized early on what it was specifically that made Shelburne's collection different from other museum collections, and that was the fact that we had Joel Barber's collection. Joel Barber was this really fascinating character. He was sort of the least likely person you would expect to collect decoys. Um, he was a Manhattan architect. He was a modernist. He, um, he, built, uh, he helped uh, build and design Rockefeller Center, uh, the Radiator Building, which you'll see in just a second. And he had never hunted in his life. So how did he get interested in decoys, you may wonder? Well, it's because of this bird right here. This is the first decoy that we know that was ever collected as a work of art. It's not a great quality decoy. Um, it was made on Long Island. The body was made by a man named um, William Salford, uh, beautiful, this red breast of McGanzer. And then it was reheaded later by a man named Frank Kellum. So it's a combination of two workers' hands. Joel Barber found this decoy in a boat shed on Long Island in 1918, and it wasn't his property. He wasn't entitled to these decoys. He just took it. And he always half-heartedly joked for the rest of his life that he didn't have clear title to a lot of his decoys. We're hoping that time and that nine-tenths of possession law thing is going to work in our favor if anyone wants to come and claim these birds. Uh, but it's really nice that we have this bird in our collection. Like I said, Joel Barber uh, helped design the radiator building. He worked for Raymond Hood Architects. 
Um, it is famously depicted in George O'Keefe's painting. And then there's um, 40 Rock, which is um, Rockefeller Center, which he had a great hand in. So Joel Barber on a, had a weird occasion where his professional life and his interest in decoys collided. And that happened in Wilmington, Delaware. This is the DuPont Hotel in Wilmington. He designed the interior for a bar. Um, and he was trying to buy a nude statue of a woman to put in the bar as decoration. And the manager of the, of the hotel said, no, absolutely not. That's just that's obscene. We wouldn't do that. And so he said, OK, how about I give you one of my decoys for, for the bar? And after a lot of prodding, um, the manager kind of kindly uh, sort of relented. And so Joel Barber took this great um, merganser, or sheldrake, as they're also called sometimes, um, and um, installed it on a bracket in, in the hotel uh, bar, giving the bar its name. It was called the Brandywine Sheldrake after that. So later on, we'll see that Joel Barber decides he wants to set up his own decoy museum, and he writes the hotel a letter, and he says, listen, I really want my decoy back. And so what they did is they, they happily complied with his request, but as a um, badge of honor and recognition of this decoy's service to the museum, the employees banded together and they bought this Tiffany um, alcohol label that they engraved Brandywine Sheldrake on that it wore for the rest of its life. Sadly, this decoy is missing, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Like I mentioned, Joel Barber was not a decoy hunter. It just didn't come naturally to him. Um, but, you know, he claimed to have been descended from a long line of hunters that stretched back to the 1640s in the Hudson River Valley area. And, um, but you can see in this uh, cartoon that he sketched on the back of some scrap letterhead, it says, damn you, how do you like this? You see death here in the guise of a skeleton standing on the back of a decoy, admonishing these birds that are coming at being lured in by, by, by the wooden birds. And there he is again. Joel Barber spent his life looking through in the nooks and crannies up along the entire eastern seaboard on the eastern fly, uh, Atlantic flyway. And he amassed an amazing collection of birds. And one of the facts that I like to point out to people is that not all of his birds were American that he collected. And that is evidenced by this decoy right here. Any guesses where that's from? Japan. Uh, and so he had two of them in his collection. And um, he was just a really extraordinary guy. You know, it's, it's easy for us to say in hindsight that he got a lot of stuff wrong, but when you're the pioneer doing this stuff and you stick your neck out and you're making these assumptions, you know, over time they will be proven wrong. And that happens in scholarship all the time. Um, so I cut Joel a little bit of slack. Um, some other amazing birds. So when uh, this is the ruddy duck mate that we have uh, in our collection, we have two of them. Um, I'll talk a little bit later. Just remember this one has a beautiful body of paint on it. Um, and then where is it? Oh, it's not here. Um, it's in a different picture. Uh, he has an amazing redhead. So these are the two ruddy ducks that we have in our collection made by Lee Dudley, this amazing man who was a market gunner, who was, after the legislation was passed, decided to retire and become a dirt farmer in Virginia. He was carving and hunting in North Carolina. And Joel Barber um, stumbled across these two decoys. Actually, I think he stumbled across eight of them. Uh, I'm still trying to, to verify this because he was giving them out to other people at different times in his life. But these were the two that remain. And so through the help of a friend locally, they discovered that the LD on the bottom of the decoys that were branded there um, meant, identified them as being made by Lee Dudley. And Joel Barber tracked him down to Virginia, and he brought the two the decoys with him. And Lee Dudley um, had retired, like I said, and he just abandoned these decoys. Or maybe that's not true. I think he sold them for like fifty cents or something like that, which seems insane to us today. But um, he took the two decoys to Lee Dudley's house, and Lee was waxing nostalgic about his time as market gunner. And he and Joel formed this this connection. And so Joel took when he before he was leaving. Dudley requested that he leave one of the ducks behind. And so Barber assented. And so they, um, a couple of weeks later, back in New York, that decoy that, Bar that um, Dudley had requested that stayed came back with a fresh coat of paint. Now, this has caused a lot of confusion for people. We A couple of months ago, I had a couple of um, decoy experts come 
and look at our collection, and because you have our unpainted, unfinished decoy, these collectors felt like we had painted it on our own. And we're like, no, 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 this is the maid. Um, if you want to see the real one, you have to go to Peoria to see that great show. Um, this is one of my favorite birds in our collection because this represents three generations of masters in one decoy. So as we were evaluating our collection, we, we took them to the local hospital at UVM um, uh, Medical Center, and we had them all x-rayed because we wanted to learn about their construction, and we discovered in this bird that there are three hands, and Joel Barber knew that when he collected it. So there was a man who is credited with starting the Stratford, Connecticut School of Carving. His name was Albert Lang. The irony is, is that he started carving in New Jersey. He didn't carve when he was in um, Connecticut. Um, but when he brought his rig of decoys with him, I think there was like 112 of them or 115 of them, um, it inspired local carvers like Ben Holmes um, to start carving, and so they adopted his style. Albert Lang has been credited with coming up with this idea of carving decoys heads in different positions so that they look more lifelike. Um, he is also credited with, with starting to use um, copper nails so they wouldn't rust in um, salt water. And he's just this really interesting guy, and hollowing out the interior. So, you know, that may not be correct, but that's just kind of what he's been credited with. And the way we know, we know that this body was carved by Lang, um, because the seam runs around the middle of the decoy. Early on, he carved the, the boards around the bottom, but later he transitioned into this middle seam. At some point, this poor decoy, his head was blown off, and his... His protege, um, Ben Holmes, carved this replacement head. And at some point, Charles Shane Wheeler, another master um, Stratford carver, painted the decoy. So this is really uh, an extraordinary example in our collection. I think some collectors would have issues with it, but I like it because there are three hands that are at work here. Jill Barber um, developed relationships with some contemporary um, uh, carvers. For some reason, he didn't like Elmer Kroll. He only had one or two mentions of, the, of Elmer Kroll in the book that he would later write. I don't understand that. I've never found any correspondence or anything to say why. He loved Joe Lincoln, who was another carver from Cape Cod area, um, who was carving beautiful decoys, but I think many people would prefer Elmer, Elmer Kroll today. But he also worked with Shane Wheeler, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. And here he had struck up a relationship with Lim Ward, who was part of the Ward brothers, um, who were these famous carvers from the Harvard de Grasse, uh, Maryland area, who were barbers, they were twins, um, they carved together. Um, Lim was born with a defect in one of his hands, and so he had said, said he had difficulty in carving. I don't think that's true, because these two decoys were carved specifically by him and painted by him. But the story goes is that he would paint the decoys after his brother Steve um, would carve them, and that you could tell that because it was hard for him to get up underneath the bills. And so there's always like a blank spot missing um, paint underneath. But these decoys have paint underneath their, their bills, so I don't know if that's necessarily true. But these were extraordinary because um, Lynn Ward, the last surviving of the brother, um, inscribed uh, a really lovely note on the bottom of these decoys for Barber. This is one of our favorite pieces in our collection. There's a lot of um, discussion about actually who carved this swan. Um, swans um, were hunted in certain areas of around Currituck Sound in North Carolina. Um, I, you know, some people say they're good eating. I don't necessarily know. I think the cygnets, the small, the small swans, were good eating. Um, but this is a masterpiece in our collection. And some people say, and like Joel Barber, that it was carved by a name Sam, Samuel Barnes. Stylistically, looking at other decoys that survive, they look very much like um, swan decoys that were being carved by men named Holly. Um, from the same area. So it's, you know, I'm hedging my bets and I call it the Barnes um, Holly Swan. Um, but what's really funny about this piece is that you see here its neck is broken. And I was lucky enough to find a recording that Joel Barber had done right before he died. And he was talking about how he acquired some of his best decoys. This was in preparation for a second book, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but the. Uh, he says in there that he found this decoy at a man's house. Um, who, his name was um, Bennett Keen. Ben, Bennett Keen, that's his name. And he begged him to buy this decoy. Begged him and begged him. He said, no, no, I don't want to sell it. He said, I have a neighbor who goes and bets on the ponies. And as a good luck charm, 
Every time he walks by my house before he goes to the track, he grabs the decoy by the neck and spins it around a couple of times. And so we think that's why the neck is broken. I'm not certain. It could just be a defect in the way in the construction of, of the decoy. But it's a really, really beautiful piece. Um, and Joel Barber later convinced Mr. Keene to sell it to him for $4 in change and, a, and a, a copy of a sporting magazine that he had on his hand. So that's how we acquired one of the most important decoys known today. Um, these are an extraordinary pair of um, passenger pigeon decoys that were carved by a man named Joseph Cowden from Aiken, um, Maryland. And um, they're really interesting. He's, he claimed that he and his brother carved these as young boys when they would hunt pigeons. I don't know necessarily if that's true. Some people say they look like morning doves. Some people say they look like passenger pigeons. Uh, from my perspective, I go with what Joel Barber says. So kind of interesting stuff. Joel Barber was really great at um, promoting himself and promoting the conservation and um, appreciation of decoys in the early part of the 20th century. And he, he really became synonymous, his name became synonymous with decoy collecting. And um, so much so that Joel Barber became the subject of a children's book. This is um, John Held's book, Danny Decoy. It's a rather sweet book about um, a, a man who, um, a hunter who buys a decoy straight from the carver, and he goes out and he, the decoy becomes enamored with a living duck. The storm comes along, the string breaks, the decoy is able to follow his love out to sea. He's then eaten like Jonah by a whale, and he is regurgitated at some point, and he finds his way back to a little boy on the beach. But it's really cute that Joel Barber here is seen as the, the decoy hunter in spite of the fact that he didn't hunt. So Joel Barber, early on, we know from his artwork that he produced, decided around 1923 that he was going to write the first definitive book on the subject of American wildfowl decoys. And he, here, this is one of the things we have in our archives. This is a study for the cover of the book. It was originally published in 1932 in very low um, numbers. It was like 50 books. And then it was later reprinted in larger editions by Daredale Press. Um, and so the book cover changes um, with every different print. And so he, he decides that because he's a, a trained architect, he's a draftsman, right? He's really good at copying what he sees and laying them out in kind of architectural plans. And so he starts on what he calls these wash drawings. He never calls himself a watercolorist. He never calls himself an artist. And you'll see later he always signs it Joel Barber D-E-L. And people are like, what does D-E-L mean? It means delineator. He thought he was a delineator, not, a, not an artist. And so here you see this great... Um, it, uh, image that he created of um, one of the tool um, canvas back uh, decoys that were found in the Lovelock Cave in Nevada in 1911. These decoys were discovered by accident when some miners were digging through back guano in a cave outside of Nevada and they discovered this cache of you know 2,000 year old decoys that were made out of reeds and had um, canvas back feathers stuck in them. If you go to the American Museum of Indian of the Indian in um, New York City, you'll find them. They may be now in D.C. I'm not sure, but last I knew they were in New York City, and it's just truly an extraordinary thing. And that's one of the things that Joel Barber did was he helped promote decoys as a uniquely American art form, saying, "Listen, our ancestors were doing this way back 2,000 years ago." And um, I love that he, um, I think, it, I can't remember what the exact quote is, but one of his chapters said, uh, a long time ago, a Native American, uh, an Indian had a swell idea. Uh, and that's how he prefaces his work on the decoys. These are some of the more energetic um, renditions of the birds in his collection um, that he included in the book. This is a, a canvas back decoy. And I love this orthographic portrayal of the decoy. So you take it's an art it's an architect's trick, it's a designer trick, where you take a three-dimensional object and you show different angles of it so that you get the sense of that three-dimensional uh, sculpture in on two in two dimensions. And you can see that he's very heavily inspired by Art Deco styling, modernist styling. And you know, a lot of people say, well his you know, he's just doing these portraits of decoys, they're not that fascinating. To me, they're really fascinating because the conditions of these birds changed over time. You can track that. But also what I love about his um, renditions are the, the water. You'll see his depictions of water, which are pretty extraordinary. 
This is an extraordinary one. See the zigzag water. They're all a little bit different. This is a primitive black duck um, that Joel Barber had in his collection that was carved by um, Wilbur Corbin from Bellport, Long Island. Really extraordinary. That gash along its head there, we have it in the museum. It's, it's pretty interesting. Um, again, he goes back. He wanted people to look at these decoys and be able to reproduce them. There's a little bit of conflicting uh, intention here because he always said that you could never forge the work of the old masters, but he then provided you plans to do it. So it's a little, it's a little interesting that. Um, again, remember the Brant we saw in the first picture um, uh, with the cobs. This is his rendition. The, the, the sky here is really extraordinary in its reflection in the water. He also provided um, these line drawings. So this is kind of sort of his process. He would start out making these line drawings, which he later included in the book. And here you see this great um, pin tail that was carved by um, John Blair Jr. And there's a little bit of um, controversy because in one part of the book, he claims it was done by Jr. Then later it was Sr. And so there's a little confusion. Stylistically, it looks like it was carved by, by the younger um, Mr. Blair. Here's the actual decoy. I've never seen decoys of this size. This is extraordinary. Um, Joel Barber was interesting too. He didn't, he appreciated the ducks that were looked realistic in their, in their interpretation, but he advocated that you needed to be abstract with your paint um, plumage and painted plumage. And so he came up with these um, interesting uh, pl color plates that are published in the book. Oh, sorry, again, my apologies. Um, and you can see here, he's, he's really bright, breaking down the different plumage patterns into these very simple forms. Um, really extraordinary. And I love how, you know, his little design elements where he's showing you um, the different sexes of the birds. So Joel Barber at a certain point decides that, you know, it's not enough to just collect these decoys. He's, he's, a, he's a maker, he's, a, he's an artist obviously, even though he doesn't consider himself to be one. And so he decides that he knows enough about decoys that he can create the perfect decoys. So the last chapter in his book, the 20th chapter, by the way, um, he, just, he includes these plans for what he calls the modern decoy. And what he's done is he's taken design elements from other birds in his collection, and he's created these amalgamations, right? Like, um, he talks about how, like, the keels were from a, a bird he found in Maine, uh, the heads that deep saddle, the way they sit in there is another main um, characteristic. And then the use of, instead of nailing the head in or gluing the head in, um, he decides that he's gonna include a cotter pen. And he said that he was inspired by a decoy from Maine, and please forgive me, these are not my words, um, from a, 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 a town, an Indian drunk, who um, carved these decoys. I think he meant um, Gus Wilson. I think he just didn't have the, the knowledge yet. Um, but anyways, he creates these extraordinary blueprints, and then he follows through and he makes his own decoys. And the heads on these are interchangeable. They're really beautiful. Um, they're not very functional. There are some people who claim that they listed in the water. They didn't float right. Um, so he didn't actually create. And they're clunky, and some people said they're ugly, but I think they're pretty interesting. And you can see how he was making them here with these scoring lines. He does it for... Um, mallards and um, black ducks as well. And this is the decoy that he has um, included and pictured in the book. And you can see that cotter pin sticking out that holds the head in place. Um, some of you may notice that there are multiple holes in the keels underneath. And that was so that you could take your weight and you could move it back and forth to adjust for the, the strength of the current of, of the water that these decoys were being used in. So Joel Barber, not resting on his laurels, decides, you know what, I'm going to make my own decoys and start a company. And so in 1936, he forms Barber Decoys New York. And what he's doing is he's trying to promote decoys as pool ornaments for your, for your ornamental um, ponds and swimming pools. And so he creates these decoys. And we, I found in his archives these extraordinary photos of the decoys in his pond, in a planter, in his yard. <laughs> And what he was doing is he was offering several different species, and they weren't, they weren't cheap. They were $15, which is a lot of money back in 1936. And so he was trying to be avant-garde. And so this is his um, contemporary take on a mallard um, uh, plumage pattern. He gets a lot of flack for his designs, and people don't really like them, so he decides he's going to take another swing at this. 
And, and so, so in 1939, he does another rendition of his designs for the decoys. Um, and you can see here, this is what he came off with. And here, he's moved, he's gotten rid of a lot of the holes, and here he's just got the two, so. And that went bust. No one really caught into those either. And so later, he worked with Ted Mulligan uh, at the uh, Wild Fowler uh, Decoy Company in Saybrook. And um, he had gotten these replicating machines, which were basically lathes, so that you could, you could carve it up, you could put it in the lathe, and the, the, the blades would follow that form and replicate it on another block. And so you can see that in these, in these examples. And there's the, you can see on the, the weight there, um, uh, wildfowl decoys. So Joel Barber, like I mentioned, was a great advocate for decoys, and he started these duck shows. This is a sign that he made advertising the book that he would eventually write in the 1930s, published in the 1930s, but he was working on the illustrations in 1923, and he exhibited a bunch of them at the very first decoy show in Belport, Long Island. It was an event that was um, ho hosted by the Anti-Duskers League of Hollow Point. And Anti-Duskers were people who were trying to raise awareness of this illegal way of hunting ducks. It was very unfair. You'd wait until it was dusk and the ducks couldn't see well, and you'd wait there with your gun and you'd just blast on smithereens. It was particularly a pernicious um, illegal activity that continued on Long Island. And so this whole event was designed to not only advertise that this is illegal and there are better ways of killing ducks that are more sportsmanlike, but also as a way of bringing the community together and um, connecting contemporary decoy carvers with people who were starting to collect um, historical decoys. In that show, a man named Charles Shang Wheeler, um, that I've already talked to you a little bit about, uh, being a Stratford carver, really rose to the occasion and shocked everyone when his um, mallard drake, shown here in the foreground, um, took the grand prize. He was relatively unknown at the time. And Barber, like I said, had some regard for contemporary carvers, but he and Shane Wheeler really hit it off. And a couple of years later, Shane Wheeler gifted the mallard and the, the hen, the drake and the hen, to Joel Barber as a Christmas present, and that's how they came into our collection. Joel included this decoy in his book, and this is his um, illustration that he created. He and Joel Barber, uh, Shane Wheeler and Joel Barber struck up a friendship, um, and in 1932, Joel and Shang, as he's called, um, had an exhibition. Does anyone know where this is? Can you guess where this might be? Look at, look at the context of the space. It's on the 13th floor of Abercrombie and Fitch's headquarters on Madison Avenue in New York. This is the penthouse, the log cabin penthouse, um, Joel Barber took 116 of his own decoys and 34 decoys made by Joel, uh, Charles Shang Wheeler, and they exhibited them together in this great um, exhibition. And I discovered, I was always wondering what these things were in our, in our collection. I'm like, they're kind of weird. They're obviously keys for something. Um, but what I discovered was that these are the maquettes that Joel Barber designed as the program for the exhibition at Abercrombie & Fitch. And they're really extraordinary. You can see here Joel Barber's collection. One of the, the greatest mysteries to me is what happened to this Canadian um, mallard head that has been stuffed and on a stick. It's not in our collection, and it's not purported to have been lost. I don't know if he gave it away or traded it at some point, but it's a really extraordinary piece. And this was the layout he did for Shane Wheeler's um, section in the, in the, in the program. Um, really extraordinary. Joel Barber even designed a window display for Macy's in New York. And I've been trying my darndest to find out whether or not it was actually realized. I have called the headquarters. I have called the people who are the contemporary window dressers. No one seems to know. They don't have good archives. So I don't know if Joel Barber realized this or not. But what's really great is that you can recognize specific decoys that he intended to include. This is that Barnes Holly Swan. This was a great Orm um, main um, loon that we'll talk about in just a little bit. There's that Sheldrake, the, the Brandywine Sheldrake. And then he even includes, where is it? He even includes his own decoys in here. So he was pretty proud of those things. This is the best picture. That may be why that goose's, uh, that swan's neck is broken. 
So Joel Barber um, exhibited in this um, show uh, put on by the Nodler Gallery in New York City, and this was during the Depression, you remember. And so they did this ar uh, architect's hobby show where they would sell tickets for admission and the proceeds would benefit the drafters, the people who were doing the line drawings in the architectural firms who were hit hard by um, the bad economy and were, were out of work. And you can see here Joel Barber with reins on his swan um, riding it in this photograph. Uh, Joel Barber's wife passed away, I believe. Her name was Dorothy in 1946. And Joel decided that it was time for him to leave the city. So he retires to Wilton, Connecticut. And he lives in a converted apartment in the garage of his son David's home. And in the backyard was an old chicken coop. And David encouraged his father. He had two sons, Joseph and David. But David really encouraged his father to share his collection and his knowledge with the public. And so they established the old shanty, the, the shanty old, the, uh, museum of old decoys in this uh, chicken coop. And what's really amazing, oh, this is so funny, uh, he hung the decoys from the trees. He had them in ponds. He had what art historians refer to as horror vacui, the fear of empty spaces, because every surface of this chicken coop was covered. That's actually the, the goose that he had hanging from the, uh, suspended from the tree. That's the interior of the space. Again, you can see this amazing eider. This is extraordinary. Um, it was splitting in half, and Joel Barber took it upon himself to mend it together. And he painted one side so it looked pristine. The other side is still weathered. And you can see the dowels that he's just shoved in. He didn't even bother to like saw them off and sand them down. Um, it's, it's one of my favorite pieces in the collection because it's just such an unusual thing. Um, you can see he was including um, uh, the, the uh, passenger pigeons on there. And if you just look at the very top, it's kind of hard to see. The ceiling was covered in blueprints for his decoy designs. So again, couldn't, couldn't get enough of himself. Um, these are extraordinary. This is that swan again. This is a William Bowman or Charles Sumner Bunn um, voucher uh, that Joel Barber mistakenly attributed to Elmer Kroll based on the quality of the work. I know there's a lot of controversy right now in the decoy world about were they carved by uh, Charles Sumner Bunn or William Bowman. I hedge my bets, I'm an agnostic, and so I said, you know, I, I would put them both in there. There is some evidence to suggest that they might actually be Charles Sumner Bunn, but please don't hate me for saying that. Hate me for other reasons. Um, Joel Barber, again, with these shows, was coming up with great graphic designs for the North American decoy makers, um, or decoy, uh, North American Decoy Makers Club, I believe is what it is. And that was based off of a great, um, a great uh, Lloyd Parker goose that we have in our collection that has been completely de been denuded of its paint. It's really pretty beautiful. And um, here you see that poster was for the 1951 uh, Duck Show. And this is a picture of Joel Barber in the center here. This would wind up being his last Duck Show. He would die the next year. And one of my favorite things about this was one of the criteria was is that your duck had to float, right? And so there's this great photograph of them throwing one of the ducks into the water to see if it would ride itself. So Joe Barber's willingness to share his decoy collection with the world came with some, uh, some danger in the fact that there was a group of 34 decoys that went missing at one point. Joel Barber had his decoys on view at a, I don't want to mention the name of the gallery, but it was a folk art gallery in New York City. They were on long-term loan. They were there from 1940 to 1944. In 1944, the gallery kind of goes bust, and so they're shipping back the decoys. Well, they shipped them back in multiple shipments, but one shipment never made it back to Joel Barber. We don't know if there's any nefarious activity going on here, but they've never turned up. And among those 34 shown in this, pic this picture here, these are the ones that have gone missing. They're really extraordinary. Um, you can see here is this redhead that is Canadian, had movable wings that were activated by pulling a string. I've never seen anything like that. Um, again, here he has a Gus Wilson um, scoter. Um, we actually have one in our collection now, but it came later, much later. 
Uh, this is an extraordinary sheldrake where the head was carved from an apple root, apple tree root. This is a green winged teal that was a stick up decoy, so you would put it on a dowel. Here's another Lloyd Parker. This is an Albert Lang, remember the guy I said who was responsible for changing the head positions of decoys. You see this, um, I think this is a bluebell, I can't really tell, um, where he's got his head turned backwards and he's preening. And then just another sleeping teal. So these are these were major losses to Joel. And throughout his life, he, you know, it was his wish that they would turn up so that he could share them with the world. But sadly, they never have. This is that this is that goose that was um, illustrated in his first book. There's a great poem, Joel Barber. I didn't, I can't remember it off the top of my head, or uh, and I and I don't have it in front of me. But Joel Barber was a poet. He was a romantic. He wanted to romanticize the history of American decoys. And he wrote this amazing poem called Reformed. And all of his poems that are related to decoys are very, like, forlorn. It's like, why have I been taken out of the water and just put on a shelf for people to admire? I'd rather be, you know, have been shot to pieces and rest at the bottom of the, of, of the river. Um, and he wrote a really beautiful one about this decoy where he talks about the, the beautiful cracked china ch uh, colored chest. Um, this is that depiction of that um, Canadian redhead with the movable wings. You can see there he's got the strings on the back that the, the hunter would, would pull and activate them. Here's a loon. This was the Orm loon. It was supposedly made by a man named Orm who lived in Maine and was a lighthouse um, light keeper. And this was Joel Barber's favorite decoy. I cannot tell you how many times he drew this bird, how many ways he incorporated them into like Christmas cards. This was his favorite bird. I think this may have been the one that he felt lost the most. And here you see him holding it in his hand. And if you notice that the weight on this is a stone that's strapped to the decoy by leather. And then there's that other um, sheldrake that went missing. So, so Joel Barber, Barber in 1949, decides that it's time for him to write another book. When he wanted to write the first book, he originally conceived it as being nothing but draw, measured drawings and those watercolor um, paintings. But at the time, in the 1930s, that would have been exorbitantly expensive to produce. And so they talked him out of it and said, listen, you really need to help us establish a canon for American wildfowl decoys. So you need to write the book. So that's what he did. He was not a great writer. Sometimes it's like reading stereo instructions. But, but there's, there's really important information in there, and he really deserves credit for being truly the first authority on decoys. And so he decides at the end of his life he's going to go back and he's going to revisit that idea of just doing the diagrams. And he starts on this book called The Decoys of North America. And again, he decides, no, there's so many stories I need to tell before I go. He knew he was not well um, at this point in his life, and so he decides what he's going to do is he's going to record himself. So he sits down and he's recording the different chapters of what would go in the book, just in case he didn't quite make it, which sadly he didn't. And there were five recordings that we know of. Four of them have gone missing. Thankfully, one of them still survives, and the owner of it has let us uh, copy it into a digital sound format. And then I've transcribed the whole thing, and it is just chock a lot full of great nuggets about how he collected. It was going to be a 10-chapter book. Um, it was really going to be something. Uh, this was going to be the frontis plate for it. And I love this image he drew here of that Lovelock Cave canvas back decoy and this really kind of stylized canvas back being shot through the chest with a Native American arrow. This is what it was going to look like. No one has ever seen these. Um, I've spent the last two and a half years what I call productive procrastination. When I'm getting frustrated with one show, I have to do something that makes me feel like I'm contributing to something. So I went into the archives two and a half years ago and really did a deep dive back into Joel Barber's papers because there were certain things I didn't understand and I wanted to make sense of all of this. And I think that I have figured out what that last book was going to look like. And I'm kind of excited about that. And it's going to be a major part of my, my show that's coming up. And then he did this strange carving on like a cutting board of that same image. So he starts out in 1949 drawing these decoys that he felt were important. This is a whistler. And he does them in this very stylized way in these orthographic, again, orthographic depictions. I love, you know, his stylization of the weight, you know, there's the heart-shaped weights, and 
he's done it here at the different views. And then it was going to be accompanied by a simple watercolor just like this for an overall. He also adopts this really strange insignia that he uses in a lot of his paintings um, and uh, a lot of his correspondence. So I guess that was kind of the Joel Barber brand. And he did this great decoy. This is um, a Sam Soper um, standing uh, goose, a stick-up goose. It was owned by Mr. Mackey, the other great collector at the time, and another uh, great author. And this was one of Joel Barber's all-time favorite decoys. And again, he illustrated this thing many, many times. Um, I think we have uh, at least two versions of this same kind of orthographic design. That was its watercolor. There's like three of these that he did. He did he, for the first time. He he uh, looks at the the Holly. Barnes Swan or Barnes Holly Swan, and he creates this diagram. Before that, he never drew it outside of like those preparatory sketches for window displays. So this is kind of interesting. He did several versions of this one and has this weird little picture-in-picture picture, um, aspect to it. That's very unusual. And then on January second, nineteen fifty-two, Joel Barber suffers a massive heart attack and dies. And this is the watercolor he was working on when he died. This is a May Quillen redhead. And I think that it's a very sad and somber painting and very appropriate for its situation in his life. And we have this actual decoy in our collection. And the um, shot marks are uh, pretty accurate if you line the two up together. And so after Joel Barber died, he never left any plans for what to do with his collection. People like Cooperstown in New York, uh, the Fenimore Museum, were vying for it. And then along comes this um, sporting artist named Ogden Pleisner. He's kind of a 20th century version of Winslow Homer. He's a great um, artist. We have his definitive collection at the museum and his studio um, in one of our buildings. And he was a friend of Joel Barber's in the family. And he spoke to our founder, Electra Havemeyer Webb, her three sons, and said, listen, this collection's gonna come up for sale. Would you like to buy it? And if so, you need to move on this. And they decided they were going to buy it for their mother as a gift. And they bought the entire collection of about 350 to 400 birds and all um, hundreds, if not thousands, of pieces of artwork um, for $2,500. And they, they gave it to and they presented it to my mother, and that became the kernel of what would become Shelby Museum's decoy collection. And it, it, it arrived in 23 wooden barrels. Um, and it's this really extraordinary thing that we have. And it has been my honor and privilege to be able to work with this collection. And um, I'm hoping that you all get in your cars, drive 20-something hours to Shelburne, Vermont, uh, sometime around September 9th, and come and see the show that we're working on there. It will pale in comparison to what Zach has done here, but at least you'll see a little bit more about Joel Barber. Thank you all. You've been very, very patient with me tonight. I appreciate everything. Are there any questions, comments, concerns, corrections? I guess I was thorough. Thank you. Thank you all.